Our next guest was the head basketball coach at BYU between 1997 and 2005, where he inherited a 1-25 and team and took them to the NCAA tournament four years later. Finished with 138 wins, he left BYU to become head coach at Fresno State, which he did for six seasons. Now retired, he plays a lot of golf, including today. It's our pleasure to welcome our longtime friend, Steve Cleveland, to the Wise Guys, live from Fresno, California, in the man cave. Coach, good to see you. Good to see you guys. Hey, how come you and I, like, have we ever played golf together? Uh, I don't think you've ever wanted to play with me. No, that's not, see, that's not a true statement. Like, we're going to start off with a false statement? No. Let me tell you about playing. I've, I've wanted to play Let me with tell you, you about lot. playing golf with Coach Clee. First, he's left-handed. So, you're, for a minute, you're thinking, well, there's Phil Mickelson and Steve Cleveland and, uh, and the lefty from BYU won the Masters. Yeah. Why can't I oh, think of Mike Weir. Mike Weir. Those are the three Mike lefties Weir. on the planet. That and it, and when you're golfing with Steve, you're with one of the three left-handed golfers on the planet. And then he hits it low with his irons, and it goes like 300 yards. And then he'll go, ah, missed that one. And, the, and, and then, it's like, and come they on. Hit the green, do they hit the green and then just stop? He puts a little backspin on it. Nice. Rolls it up in there. How, I, how did you shoot today? Uh, You know, I shot 81. I played better the back nine. I shot a 39, so... It was good. It was good. <laughs> so we, we hey, beautiful day. I think we're done. With, degrees. We're done with golf around here unless we come over and play with you, Coach. Because it's not gonna. It's winter over here now. May, maybe like if you come down to the tournament with us this year, we could play in Vegas. That would be sweet. Oh, I'd love to do that. Do you, and I know a guy named. I don't know if you know. I know a guy named Dave McCann. He's got some hookups in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, we got. We Dave and I both have lots of you, golf. You up have up good Vegas, golf. So hookups. His are better than mine. His are better than mine. Hey, when, when you had to coach a team that's lost its confidence like the BYU football team has, what kind of things did you do as a coach to help bring it back? You know, obviously I'm dealing with 15 or 16 guys and they're dealing with, you know, 80 or 90. But I, I think the, the first thing that would come to my mind would be kind of the connections and relationships with young people. And, I mean, for me, if I had a kid or if Travis Hansen was struggling – it may be me and Travis Hansen on the court after practice by ourselves. And I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one things, whether it was on the floor or maybe just going to lunch and just getting that connection and making sure it's there and that he understands that I trust him and that I'm with him. Because anybody that has been involved in athletics has gone through highs and lows. And so I, I think for, you know, for a football team, I've never, I, last time I played football, I think was Pop Warner in seventh and eighth grade. But I, the, the one thing that I really have seen and watched the last two or three years is that Kalani has developed a, a, a really healthy culture. And uh, everything, all the evidence that I have seen is that he has great relationships with his guys. He has a great relationship with the community and his staff. And But I, I think the first thing I always did was either go out and work a guy out or watch film together. I'm telling you right now, that when you as a head coach, go and it's just you and that individual. And I don't know whether it's a quarterback or a wide receiver group, a small group, when you can have that one-on-one -on -one or one-on two or three guys and sit there and just talk honestly and kind of navigate the difficulty that maybe they're going through at a particular time, uh, it, it strengthens guys' confidence to know that the head coach would sit down. And I, I found that when I would have really had guys, especially guys that had performed in the past, much like this group has done, um, I, I just found like we had a lot of success there and it, and it kind of got them comfortable, put them in a position where they got their confidence back and they knew that I had their back and that I trusted them. And I think those are things that are really important. And I mean, I, I've watched this football program and I, I know they have all those culture things working. They have amazing relationships and maybe you can't just meet with a few guys, but I think as a head coach and, and whatever sport I was, I, I would reach out to the leaders of that team. The, the seniors, the juniors, the guys that are counted on in the locker room. Yeah. And I, those are always were the first guys that I tried to make contact with yeah. and get a pulse of the team and where we were and then work from there on the technical things. I mean, one of the things that's most disruptive thing that ever happened in my tenure was injuries. And all of a sudden that depth chart, you know, football, I got so many guys, but I know in basketball, you lose a couple of key guys. It can be really disruptive. No matter how good an attitude, no matter what your culture or what you, everything you're doing, uh, it can be difficult if you don't have the guys that you need on on the field or on the floor at that given any given time. 
you know, you know, Cleve, you talk talk about maybe getting with some guys individually. Football team's really big. This could still be effective, though, right? So if you if you took a handful of guys that you knew that the rest of the team looked up to, you take a Jaron Hall, who's the quarterback, and maybe a Puka Nakua. Would it work if you just did it with a couple of guys on the offense and a couple of guys on the defense? Would they, in turn, then go lead the rest of the group for you if you could make that connection and build their confidence? I have always felt the best teams that I ever coached for 35 years in high school and junior college and, and Division One that our most successful teams were the player-led teams. They, they weren't coach-led. I, I think there's a misnomer in the public's eye that coaches do this and coaches do that. Let me tell you, players win games. Players win games. Coaches, yes, they put the schemes together, and the, but at the end of the day, the guys who win games are, are the players. And you've got to entrust them to do the things that they're good at. I, I like it. I, I mean, I've never coached football before, and maybe that's just too large a group. But I, I think getting together with those that are leaders can, can always be a positive thing. And let them take control of that locker room without coaches there. You know, I, I think a lot of times when guys have come back to me when we were struggling, I'd get word back, hey, the guys met together. Man, that's a good sign when the guys meet together and they kind of work through those things. And, um, you know, that's what that's what great teams have. They have player-led teams. And uh, But there's a lot of things that impact winning and losing and how you navigate all those difficulties. Uh, I, I can't even imagine. And that, that's the thing that's most impressive to me is – how good this program's been and what amazing coaches they must have, that they must have relationships. And I know right now everybody's kind of is uh, losing their minds a little bit with what's happened, but you, you have to coaches and players have to trust in what they know that you can't all of a sudden change all the schemes. That, that not happening when you played eight games already, you can make adjustments. You can certainly give new guys opportunities but uh, this is a time when the five or six or eight or ten guys that are leaders in this team need to step up and uh, hold everybody accountable. I'm talking about players, not coaches. Former BYU basketball coach Steve Cleveland with the Wise Guys tonight. Now, I remember watching your introductory news conference from my house in Vegas uh, when you were named head coach at BYU, and I remember wondering, Steve Cleveland, who is, who is that? Fresno City Community College, where is – where is that? And I called my dad, who was the director of the Cougar Club, and he said, trust me, this guy's going to be good. And you were good. But when you interviewed for the job, did it matter to you at all that the team you were inheriting had just gone 1-25? You know, it, that, it's, that's an interesting question because I don't, I don't think I ever really thought about that. Um, Lynn Archibald, a dear friend of mine, uh, was really a, a point of contact for me, and he's one that, it kind of made a phone call to me that, you know, possibly getting involved in the job. And uh, obviously that was a difficult time in his life because his health and he, it, it, right. it had been a real struggle. And we had developed a friendship. He, Jerry Tarkanian was a really good friend of his. They were college teammates and he had coached with them. So we had kind of a connection and Lynn would come through town and recruit. And uh, he, he kind of shared with me, kind of opened a door for me. But I don't ever really remember thinking that. I don't think I ever once thought, oh, my goodness, you know, they won one game. I knew Roger Reed. I, I mean, I had been on Roger Reed. I had come to visit with Roger two or three years later, earlier, when there was a job opening there. I had been in Roger's office. I had been uh, met with him when he came and played Fresno State. We're good friends. And I knew he's a great coach. And all the cir- I didn't know all the circumstances. Yeah. But to this day, he's one of the best coaches I've ever been around. I mean, the guy can flat out coach. And I, I learned a lot from him. And so when I had this opportunity to get involved, um, you know, I turned the paperwork in and did all those things. But Lynn, Lynn really helped me navigate that and, uh, and got me in the door. And I spent a couple of hours with President Bateman uh, when I came to make a visit, like a, probably a lot of those that were candidates for the job. And... Uh, it just felt really good. I, I still didn't really believe, I don't think in my mind, <laughs> that they were going to hire a guy like me coming from a community college that nobody knew. But it, it felt good. And the more I was around President Bateman and, and, and the, those that I met with and talked with, and at that time, uh, 
it seemed in my heart that this was a good place for me and, uh, and, a, and a great opportunity. And it worked out and uh, just changed my life. Coach, so you, you get the job. How long are you in the job where you're actually here and you're seeing what the pieces are and all of that before you can wrap your head around, oh, wow, this is what this is the amount of work that it's going to take to get this thing back rolling again. How long was that? What was that moment like? That, 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 so I, I remember flying back to Fresno. I was coaching still. And, you know, you know how Juco guys are, man. I mean, we we were together. They were so excited for me. And uh and we ended up finishing the state playoffs and I got on a plane and I flew and as I was flying back by myself and I was, uh, you know, at that time I didn't even have a staff. I mean, I knew Heath Scheuer was going to be with me, but at that point in time, I had no idea who was going to hire. And there was on that plane, some real soul searching. <laughs> and I thought, Oh my gosh, what have I got myself into here? You know, <laughs> and, you know cause you believe you can do anything. And, and I, I learned so much from so many people that influenced me. Uh, people outside of the program, guys in the program. Uh, Rondo Felberg was amazing, uh, just such a good friend and guided me and trusted me. But it was it was a challenging time, and we had to immediately go to junior college kids. You know, there was, there was no portal. I wish there had been a transfer portal. It'd <laughs> yeah. been a lot easier. Well, speaking uh, of speaking of junior colleges, you go down to Dixie to find your assistant coach Dave Rose. So you go to St. George and make the pitch. Does he think you're nuts? He's like, what? So, let me tell you a story about Dave. So <laughs> that year previously, we had gone to their tournament down in Dixie. And we, we had never played each other. We played LA City College, and I think we played some team in the desert. And uh, we ended up not playing each other, but I got to know him a little bit. But the person I knew was his assistant, John Wardenberg. I had met John working a few BYU basketball camps. And so, you know, as I'm thinking about a staff, and his name kept coming up in my mind. And uh, so I, I immediately go back to Hutchison for the junior college tournament. And I'm by myself. I'm, I'm meeting. I, I knew a lot of junior college guys. I knew a lot of assistants because a lot of assistants had come into my, we had a lot of really good players at city, right. a lot of division one guys. So I knew a lot of coaches that night when I was in Hutch, I just had an impression to call Dave. And when I called Dave, I, you know, I mean, it was almost like I was, Hey Dave, this is Clay. Uh, how are you doing? And, and I said, I want to talk to you. So, well, you, you want to talk to John? And he knew John and I were good friends. I think in his mind, he thought, yeah, uh, he's thinking I'm, I want to hire John Wardenberg at the time. And I go, no, I don't want to talk to John. I want to talk to you. I said, I'm flying back to Salt Lake uh, t tomorrow morning. Where are you going to be? He says, well, Chanel's playing in the state high school basketball tournament up in Salt Lake. Gave me the time. I flew in. Uh, got my car and went over to a little restaurant and sat down with him. And I spent about two hours with him. Yeah. And I think he was a little bit in shock, to be honest with you. <laughs> and it was like, what? And, and uh, he, you know, and so we, so anyway, we had a great talk. I think he felt good about it. He wanted to share, you know, I, I said, talk to your wife, chat with her and then let's meet in a day or two because in fact, why don't we just meet tomorrow and as you're coming down, going back to St. George, we can all talk about it. So fast forward a day, we're in my office, Dave comes in, Chanel, his wife, you know, everybody's there, Cheryl's there. And I start, to, you know, talking to them as a group and, and about my experience and getting the job. And uh, all of a sudden I start talking about Dave coming and working. And all of a sudden Chanel has got like crocodile tears. She's crying. Cheryl's crying and I look at Dave and he's got a smirk on his face. And I said, please tell me you've talked to him about the conversation we just had for two and a half hours. Yesterday. And he goes, no, I never said anything. I said, give me a break, Dave. Oh, come you know? on. So I had, I had to manage that and work through that. And, you know, Chanel, she's going to a senior in high school, right. can leave all her friends. She didn't care anything about BYU basketball. And, uh, Anyway, that's that was the beginning, and then eventually Dave and I had spent about four months living in the Marriott there downtown Provo, and put a staff together and and moved forward. So it was kind of an interesting experience with Dave. So the two, it's not it's the, the three of you together really, because because you and Heath and and Dave are and then Wardenberg was then, in then there. He, Wardenberg eventually came right up to BYU. And, and, well, let me tell you a story about Brian Santiago. 
Oh yeah, yeah. So, so I'm at my house now. I knew Brian uh, because he played at Fresno State. And Brian is the and, associate AD, AD now, right yeah. now with uh, Tom Homo. Okay, right. Great. And so I, Brian is uh, working for a company. He's in sales. Uh, we played some city league together. We had a bunch of group of coaches that particular, I didn't, had not played in a long time. And so I got around Brian a little bit more and, and got to know him and his wife. And, but I followed him when he played for Gary Colson at Fresno state, who was the coach there. And we, we were good friends. And one night, so I get the job and all of a sudden one night there's a knock on the door and he goes, Cleve, I got to come with you. I, I, I want to be a part of your staff. And, and, you know, he's in the sales business and, and he has never coached. He's obviously a really good player. And I said, Brian, first of all, this is stretch them hiring me. Okay? <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, they had to go out on a large limb just to hire me. And then I bring in more junior college guys. And now I'm going to tell them I'm going to bring in a guy that's a salesperson <laughs> who's got a really solid basketball background. And so, you know, I just, I mean, it was like he was really disappointed. I said, well, we can talk more about it. And so I started thinking about Brian and how good he was with people and those kinds of things. And I thought, I, I called Rondo and I said, hey, we've never had an ops guy here. There'd never been a basketball operations yeah, guy. Director of basketball operations, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've never had that at BYU. And so I, I, I said, hey, can we fund it? Can we do this? And through it all, we were able to create that position. And, and Brian was able, now the, the funny thing about Brian, we didn't have any room, there was no office. So Brian and I, this is honestly the only place in America this would happen. <laughs> Brian and I share an office for four years. Four the years. head coach and it, the director of basketball operations share an office. It's insane. And if they make matters worse, over there in the corner of the office are stacks of catalogs and books and things of all the stuff he's still selling. So he's working that job. <laughs> oh my <He's> goodness! My <laughs> <laughs> You're quite an office. A lot of coming yeah, and going it was, there. It was a little crazy, but Brian Brian was a great asset to me and to the staff in, in many different ways. There's a side story which we're not going to talk about tonight, but we'll talk about when we get Jeff Jedkins on here. Mm -hmm. Is that creation of that position that you did for Brian was the same position that allowed you to bring Juddy from Utah to BYU? And then over to the women's head coaching job where he's uh, been a legend until retiring. And so that creating that little thing for Santiago turned into some really big things for the whole athletic no, no department. Question. You uh, know, and we will tell that story. I will tell you this, though. I got a phone call from Juddy one night at about 1145 from him to me, who I really didn't know him that well. And, and that's where it started. And Juddy's been a dear friend ever since. Yeah. Hey, is there is there a game early on, Cleve, that – that you look back on and you just go, yeah, that that's where it turned. That's that's where I knew that we were on to something and that we were going to turn this thing around and eventually we'd be an NCAA tournament team. It actually happened our first year. And uh, I remember us, we at that time were like, well, I don't know, we were probably like six or seven and 16 or whatever. We, I mean, it was it, we had such a difficult task that first year and we were undermanned and undersized and coaches that were trying to figure stuff out but I, I will never forget our road trip to new mexico and to utep we had seven wins we needed to win both games which was an impossible at that time new mexico was 13th or 14th in the country sellouts and at the pit go crazy, yeah. at, at utep i called that and game I coach i called that game for ksl in the pit and you rolled out the black uniforms Yep, we did. I was just going to say that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was a classic. And we, we didn't have enough guts to do that on campus for fear that I might get, you know, they might fire me. And uh, for, for just having black of anything, you know, in terms of a uniform, that was so different. Because this but wasn't the in the color scheme, yeah. Yeah, the guys wanted to wear them. And I said, let's go, man. We got nothing to lose. And we went in there, and obviously uh, it was a crazy night. And we ended up beating New Mexico losing a 20 point lead in the second half and coming back and winning that game. I can remember the next morning, nobody's going to know this guy. You guys will remember sports babe was a very famous sports. Yes. Journalist. Yeah. And the sports. She babe. Called me. Yeah. She called me at seven o'clock in the morning. Coach Cleve, congratulations on that huge win. And then uh, we go to UTEP. I get, I get to coach Haskins and I get there at UTEP. We're practicing and he comes on the floor and says, coach, 
I don't know you. Love to spend a few minutes with you when you're done. Uh, if you if you'd like to meet, I said, oh, I'd love to meet. And uh, so when practice is over, I I go up to his office, and uh, he sits down with me. And he says, man, he says, you know, he's that was a hell of a win, coach. I don't know how you guys did that. You know? <laughs> and I said, hey, it happened. And and uh, he said, can I give you a little bit of advice and counsel? You know, I mean, this is this is from an iconic coach. I think coach, I'm all this is the bear. This is the bear. I'm all ears. And he says, first of all, I'm kind of looking at your schedule, man. I don't know who's making the schedule, but you're going to schedule yourself right out of a job. <laughs> so number one, get control of your schedule. Okay. Great advice. And number two, he says, number two, I know you just got there, but man, you guys aren't good enough. You're not going to last long in this job if you don't get some guys. <laughs> I said, Thank you, coach. Thanks, coach. And he said the third thing, and it's a bit down the line, is you just got to really coach him up. And I looked at him, you know, and I thought for him to even take any time with me, I so appreciated, but I'd never forgotten that. And we end up beating them in like triple overtime. Yeah. And it, it was an incredible experience. We won both those games and we, that first year qualified for the WAC tournament. That's right. So that, That's that was right. somewhat of a miracle, but that right then and there, I knew down the road that good things were going to happen. A little bit down that road, you win the conference championship in Vegas in the tournament in 2001. Now, BYU's only won one other conference tournament title uh, since 1992, and that's the one you won in 2001. That's a long time for just two titles. Uh, but you beat New Mexico to get to the big dance. What was that feeling like when you walked out the floor knowing that you were going to the big dance for the first time as head coach? Man, I can't tell you how uh, I get little – tingles right now you just bringing it up it, it's one of those things that we had been through so much. i tell you what the hardest thing was is getting young people in the state of utah to think that we had a real program yeah. and we fought that tooth and nail man i mean it's like nobody would talk to us nobody utah dominated all the recruiting and and and, and other schools outside and it was really hard and i had a chance i sat there with terrell and mckelly Trella Day and McKelly Wesley, Trent Whiting after the game. And we just kind of sat there and had a quiet moment together, especially McKelly, who had been through so much and been there from the beginning. And to win that and to celebrate that, uh, you know, that's a special. And you know what? That group still this day, Trella Day got married uh, uh, about a year ago. And in fact, Brian Santiago came down. Some guys came down for his wedding. They're still, that group is still really close. Mm. And, and it's because of that some of those turning of the program and getting back to where we can get back to the tournament and win championships again. Yeah. We, I, we could see those guys around, you know, we had Trent here, his wife, of course, is the, the new basketball coach here on the women's side. And he came in studio yeah. with us and we had a great visit with him. Hadn't seen him for a long time. I see McKelly around a lot. It, it's really fun to see those guys. And as you, as you, you talk about teams that are player led, you got some great leaders in those early days um, and, and when you finally turn the corner and you're going to NCAA tournament now, I, I would think that those were player-led teams, right? They were all player. I mean, you know, Travis Hansen ended up becoming a great leader. But McKelly was, I mean, he really was the foundation. But I look at Terrell, who was soft-spoken, Trent soft-spoken, Eric Nielsen, great leader. You know, Matt Montague, guys, Nate Cooper. You're, you're talking about guys that were all really driven. And, and, you know, they had to live through some really difficult times and some really difficult defeats, and they just never gave up. And, uh, and that, that was, and even, even when I left, I mean, I started thinking about uh, Keena Young and Lee Kamard and, and uh, you know, all that, that group that uh, continued that tradition and they watched all those guys. And so there, there was that leadership and, and, and Dave just did an amazing job with those guys, but the culture was set and it was there. And, and, and it, give all the credit to those guys uh, who just have carried on that program. And, and obviously there's still a great tradition and the program always has been. But early on when it was real easy not to, to believe we could get something done, it was so nice to be able to have players surround you and say, coach, we can do this. Former BYU head basketball coach Steve Cleveland's on the Wise Guys tonight live from Fresno. Before we shift to the current Cougars, 
Let me ask you this, and I love those pictures behind you. There's there's you as a coach at the Marriott Center with a packed place, and then there's there's you at uh, – what's it called for Fresno? What's that arena called? Save Mart Center. Save Mart Center, yeah, that's Dave, right. Dave and I did a whole tournament over oh, yeah. at Save Mart Center. We spent Center some time there. Where we were calling four games a day. I was about to go out of my mind four games a day. <laughs> so what was more meaningful, Steve, your first big win at BYU or the night you came back to BYU as Fresno State's head coach – and received a standing ovation. Oh, you know that was a, that was a special thing. I mean, the Fresno thing was really hard, and when all of a sudden lots of sanctions came down, and things I didn't expect to happen. But coming back to BYU that year uh, meant all everything in the world to me. I mean, I, I we were, <laughs> I think I don't I don't I never usually cried before a game, but I was really emotional. It was a really difficult time, and and. Uh, and they obviously had a great team and playing them the year before at the Save Mart Center. Uh, you know, those, those experiences, I mean, I start thinking about the beginning we, when we started the, you know, ha- putting the camps together and changing how just the little things with a father and son camp yeah. that we started many years ago. And I think how that created even it, it helped our fan base and got people interested in the program again. And, a lot of those kinds of things that we were able to do, but n- nothing ever felt like it did when I went back to the Marriott Center. I mean, that's a special place to me, always will be. And, uh, you know, I-, I can look back. There are times, don't, you, I'm not any different than anybody else. You kind of second guess yourself about things. And, and uh, I-, I know this, that a lot of the guys that were in the program and guys that continue to play for Dave, I've continued to have a relationship with. Jonathan Tomlinari is a character. I saw him <laughs> yes. when I was back, when, when JT was back, and I was there last year for a volleyball match, and I saw him, and we got a chance. And I remember, you know, him making a commitment in my kitchen, and and how much I love that kid, and so happy for his success, and all of the guys that continued on. But that was a special night, Dave. Yeah, we're we're, we're going to talk a little bit about current program. I have one other question: which is a more difficult job? head basketball coach division one basketball coach or mission president or is it the same job uh, or add one more uh bishop of a ysa yeah, war that bishop you just y- completed which, which is which is the <laughs> toughest assignment and we just had brandon Noman on as yeah, a stake president and of a YSA. Is a ysa state president right now and he just preceded you on the show but and for those that don't know coach cleveland was the mission president back in the indianapolis indiana mission um and uh you know they, they did a great job back there i we had some some of your former missionaries come through our area back here and just just loved you. Um, what what's the toughest job? Mission president, bishop of a YSA ward, or a Division one basketball coach? Well, the the one thing about the church colonies, they don't yell and scream and, and defend your name and get mad at you and upset when you lose. Most of the time, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, when we don't, when we didn't quite get uh, that number of baptisms we were looking for. Uh, you know. The, the, the thing I was the most unprepared for was probably the mission president. Um, you know, that, that came as kind of a surprise. And uh, I, you know, I had, Edward Bednar was the one that actually called us and, and, and chatted with us. And uh, early on when we came back after that, I was going to, I came to work with Dave and, and you guys and yeah. some TV. I was working for ESPNU doing about 20 or 30 games a year. And so that I knew that was going to be my home for a while. And uh, when they, they sat down with us and, you know, and asked us if, you know, this is something that we consider, I, I couldn't take the job that year. I said, but let, give us some time. And, 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 and so a little bit, I just said, well, we'll come back in a year. Let's just see where things are. And uh, Elder Bednar and then, and then Elder, President Iring, Elder Iring at that time, you know, he and the, he was an instrumental in, in my getting the job. I, I had a relationship with him and uh, they called us again. And Kip and I had, had a year to kind of think about it. And I thought I, I wanted I wanted to maybe consider getting back into coaching. But it, anyway, long story short, we decided that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we'll do. And uh, that next 10 or 11 months, um, wow, I, I had a lot of catching up to do. Let's just say that. <laughs> and you get called <laughs> one to. Thing, one you... thing that wasn't hard was being around 18 to 25 year olds. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, we, we had some, there were some themes, and I was in a state where everyone loved hoops, right. Indiana. 
And uh, I have a little presentation that I make called Touch All the Lines. I can still remember doing that in a state conference and kind of applying it to gospel principles. And I, I'm looking down at like 70 and 80 year old women in the congregation and they're nodding their heads. And, you know, these are people who've grown up with hoops. And I said, you guys know what a line tag is? You know, <laughs> everybody that plays me what a line tag was. Yes. You know? <laughs> so that, that has probably been the most difficult thing and probably the most life changing for me. Yeah. And, and I, I would submit, I don't know. You have to correct me if I'm wrong, coach. You told us that the very best teams you've ever been associated with were player led. How about in the mission field are the very best missions, the ones that are missionary led where the oh, leaders no are with you? No question. You know, uh, I'll, I'll just mention his name because he's playing on Elder Homuli, who's on the football team this year. Yes. And he had been at Stanford, and he was my last assistant to the president. Austin. And, uh, Houston. The, Houston, yeah. He, he's, a sweet, he's a sweet young man. I had a chance just recently to connect with him about seven or eight months ago and see him and talk to him. I hadn't seen him. But there is no question that the leadership in a mission is everything with the young women and the young men. And I I came, I was very fortunate to come into a mission where the missionaries were obedient. They, they struggled a little bit with finding and teaching and baptizing and some of those kinds of things at the time, but man, they bought in, had just a, and then our second, the last year we had a temple dedicated, Indiana, Indianapolis temple. And, and yeah. President Irene came back out and he dedicated that temple. And he just kind of the, one of the guys that had hired me. And so that was special to have a temple built. And to see the people of Indianapolis, uh, just just great people. I mean, it, I, I love the. I mean, I wish I need to find those Midwest prices for homes. And yeah, oh, and yeah. Good luck with that. You get so, a river. Wait, you get a would, lake would, back would, there. Would Paul George come by the mission home when when you were out there? Your guy no, Paul? No, no, no. I I saw Paul. I had to give permission. I had I called my IFR. I said, "Is it all right if I go to a game?" And <laughs> it, it took. And let, I'll tell you how dumb I was. I didn't know this. For the first year, Kip and I never took a preparation day. It was supposed to be, well, you just pick a day, afternoon, evening, you know, Friday night. And finally, I asked one of the brethren, I said, like, do, do we have a preparation day? I said, yeah, you just take an evening or whatever. Once I heard that, then I, then I, went, <laughs> I went to three or four games. And I had my grandkids come out once or twice. And they went into the locker room. And so I connected with Paul there and saw two or three games. It was fun to see him. And, and we did, you know, some good things we did for the church there, too, because there was a number of articles about why I was there, yeah. being his coach. And uh, it, it was it was a pretty cool thing. And being a basketball coach and a mission president in the state of Indiana, it kind of it helped me uh, develop relationships quicker than normal. That's okay. good. I don't know if I – did I tell you, Cleve, about when I ran into Paul and Kawhi at the at – the, No. It, I should have told you this. I don't know why I didn't call you and tell you this, but I, they were playing the Jazz in the playoffs. Clips were playing the Jazz – and I happened to be in a morning breakfast meeting up at the um, uh, the Grand America, and and Kawhi and Paul come around a corner as I'm coming out. We all had masks on at the time, right? Yeah. And, yeah. And and I'd done a bunch of stuff with Kawhi when he was at San Diego State covering the league, so I pull my mask down. And I say, "Hey, Kawhi, but it's Blaine Fowler from the oh, from," and he's like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, and so he came over and we talked about. Um, coach down there in the San Diego, San Diego State Park. Those coaches down there, I love those guys. And, you know, they're good friends of yours. But so we're talking, and Paul's just kind of off on the side, not saying much, just being quiet, you know, not. And I said, hey, and by the way, I have a dear friend that that you know well. And I said, Coach Cleveland's a very close friend of mine. Oh, my gosh, Coach. Like, he came over, and then he just brightened up, and he just talked about um, – like the influence that you had been on his life and how great you were and all this. I'm like, wow. Like it, it was really, really cool to talk to him. That's and he had, he had no interest in having a conversation. He knew that Kawhi and I knew each other. He had no interest in having a conversation. As soon as I mentioned you, he was right over in that conversation. He couldn't say enough about you. I should have told you that it was great. Know, let me, let me tell you an experience. I, his parents, when he, when he decided to, after two years to go, go out, I mean, he stays for two years and we're really good. <laughs> yeah, what, that's, and, you yeah. talk about players, was, right? There's one of the greats. Yeah, his parents and him came in and wanted to meet with me. And I mean, it, I, I, it's hard for me to even talk about, but it was a very emotional meeting between the, the four of us. And they were came in there to apologize 
because they knew how hard it was to build this thing and dealing with all the sanctions and loss of scholarships and all that kind of stuff. They knew how hard it had been, and they knew that Paul would be the anchor of this team. And I will never forget that. I mean, they did. I said, do not apologize for a minute to me. This young man has earned this. He's done it on his own. He's worked. He wasn't a highly sought after high school player. He just worked his way to a point where after a sophomore year, he wasn't even first team all conference, but guys knew that this guy had the huge upside. And so I, I, I love Paul. I love his mom and dad. I, I had a chance to connect with them a couple of times in Indiana when I was out there and sat with them. And, uh, but I appreciate you sharing that with me. He, he's a great, great young man. We went down to a Clippers game, took my kids down there and, uh, during Christmas time and, Fun, fun to see him and um, just great young man having a great career. Yeah, my my bad for not sharing that with you sooner. I should have called you right after that, coach, and and told you because I was really taken back by mm-hmm. his fondness. Great, for you. It, was Paul, really, it was really fun. A couple Paul years George, ago. Uh, Paul George with the Clippers, uh, one of your big fans, and and you helped uh, get him where he is. And it's fun to see that that appreciation. Mark Pope is going to roll out the blue white game tomorrow. Blaine and I'll be on the call, and you can see it on the BYU TV app. He's got a cornucopia of new faces on this roster. We've actually never seen a roster with more overhaul. Uh, but when you take fifth place in the WCC, that's not good enough, and 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 you got to do it. So he went and did it. How hard is it going to be for him to to blend all those guys together when they've had such little time to to get together beyond what the the summer and and a couple of months here in the fall, and that's it. You know, about a few weeks ago. Coach Pope called me and wanted to know if I was coming back for an alumni event, which I wasn't. And, and I, so I, I took just a quick moment. I said, well, how, how are the guys, you know? And, and he says, you know, th- these are great young men. There, there is a huge learning curve for a lot of them. There, you know, anytime you get guys that have never played together together, you know, that chemistry doesn't just pop because you practice hard. I mean, chemistry is something that comes from playing together. And, and he really, you know, he said, I really like this group. It's just going to take time. And, and I, I said, I understand, but it is challenging. It is challenging. And, and I, I think that patience is really important. Patience is important for Mark and his staff. Patience is important for, for the guys. And I think you have to have those conversations. You're, you're, you're not going to make excuses. I mean, all the intangibles, the effort, the attitude, the never giving up and all those intangibles have to be there every day for them to get better. I, and I, I mean, I've seen three or four of them play, and uh, one of the young men, Elder, his, Elder Hall was what he was here in uh, uh, Dallin Hall, yeah, in yeah. Field in Fresno. I got to know him and spend some time with him. I, I loved his spirit about his competitiveness, and it just felt like he was excited about the guys, and he'd share a few things with me. But I, I just know that I've watched this group. I've watched Mark, and it was a tough year last year. Uh but, but like Kalani, the, these guys, and like Tom Homo, these guys get and understand what, what a culture looks like and what, what it has to look like going forward. And I think people have to be patient. Uh, we tend not to be. I mean, you start thinking about it's, the WCC has been tough enough as it is. I mean, last year was the best WCC league I've ever seen yeah. uh, during the time I've watched with Gonzaga, St. Mary's, San Francisco, Santa Clara, BYU, and and. It was a great league last year, and uh, I don't know how it's going to be. I'm sure St. Mary's and and uh, Gonzaga and San Francisco has a few guys back, so they might be pretty solid too. But I, I would just say this: that people need to be patient because it it you it just can't happen. The practice is one thing; you got to have game experience. And a lot of these guys have not played at this level, and they certainly haven't played many reps together. And I, I know they jump into it with a really good tournament, so. I, I know this staff knows how to handle this, they, but it, I know the pressures of a community that want them to be successful now, but I would just say people need to be patient. It's going to take a little bit of time. And really, big picture, they're going into the number one basketball conference in America, in the world, <laughs> That's <Right>. not, <laughs> that, right. that aren't pros. And, uh, and so sometimes you have to do certain things to get ready for that next step as well as trying to win games every night. Uh, but I'm excited about watching them. I plan on being in town for a few games. Good. And uh, certainly the Big 12 is going to be just 
amazing to be a part of that. That'd be really fun to have Kansas and the light coming in. We, we, you oh know, my God. Final four type teams coming in for home games every year will be fun. A couple of uh, youngins that had that we saw last year, um, bigs that had some promise. Uh, Fusene Traore, um, he seemed to just improve by leaps and bounds every time he walked out on the floor last year. And then Atiki Ali Atiki, you know, Mark told us last year, man, he's really raw, but his skills, he's like, he has a big 12 skill set. And when he's just talking about physical abilities, like feet, hands, you know, jumping ability, length, all those kinds of things. Those two guys, what what can we expect in terms of improvement from last year to this year from those two big guys? I, I think I think probably some of the things, like the story inside, I, I think at the end of the year, uh, it, it, with all the things going on, that it, it became easier for them to, to guard him because guys weren't hitting threes and all of a sudden the perimeter players were knocking shots down and people started sagging. And it was really hard. I watched him kind of evolve to about midway through the season. He was getting deep post touches. He was attracting double teams and kicking out and doing those things. And at the end of that season, it was, it was more and more difficult because people were preparing for them differently. I think the thing that you're going to see, I, I don't know, I haven't watched practice, but I think both of them, having gone through what they went through last year, probably motivated them to really spend a lot of time and effort watching film, working out, step, being able to step away. I think for a story, he's got to be able to step away and hit a 17-foot shot. When he can do that, he can pick and pop, not to just roll. I mean, bigs are bigs, and, and then all of a sudden you, you can front. It's easier to front him and keep him from getting the ball and giving him post touches deep down or covering down. People have different techniques to, to guard both those guys, but they should be coming in with a lot of confidence. Number one, they've been here, they've been through it, and I would expect in their own way, I mean, I don't know either one of those guys, but when you listen to them being interviewed, yeah. I mean, it's so impressive. They seem, without guile, so humble, so willing to work, and, and so all in that I can't help but believe that they're going to be much better this year. And, and I'm sure, too, just through the growth of nerves and matchups and those kinds of things. So they are going to have to rely on those guys early on. What what kind of guard play do you hear from them? Who, it, they, I know they brought some guys in. Is there anybody that's kind of popped up? The, that, the, uh, the, the one guy that they're really hoping can be an immediate impact is the Coastal Carolina transfer, Rudy Williams, yeah. um, who uh -huh. they think can, can really help. And, and Trey Stewart is fresh off of a mission last year. You know, we talked to Mark, and Mark thought that he'd make a quantum leap from last year to this year. Really athletic. Um, you know, can play downhill, can turn the corner and finish at the rim, but also can shoot. Um, so, so the, you know, those are two kind of known commodities because – because Trey Stewart was here last year in the program, and Rudy played at Coastal Carolina at a high, high level. But but when you talk about shooting, I think they've been pleasantly surprised by how good the return missionaries are shooting the ball yeah. right, nice. right away. And 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 those are big guys that can shoot, you know, the kind that yeah. you used to love. You, you love those 6'5 wings, right? Um, so, and Hall's not 6'5", but he's really strong. He's a physical kid, right? And so I... I think this team is going to be a much better perimeter shooting team than they were last year, which, as you mentioned, is really going to help Foose and Atiki inside. If you got guys that can knock down shots, oh, yeah. everything's better inside, right? Yeah, that, and that's what happened at the end of the year. I mean, guys weren't shooting, and and, uh, and then you'd double the point guard constantly, and all of a sudden, you know, those guys were attracting two and three defenders, and it was really hard to score in the last three or four weeks of the season. Yes. But if, you, if you can get – you can open that floor up, with good perimeter shooting, uh, I don't think we have any idea what the potential is or either one of those guys scoring inside as well. Yeah, Toulson can shoot it. Hall can shoot it. They've got some guys that can shoot it. So Look yeah. forward to seeing them tomorrow night uh, in a scrimmage against each other and then an exhibition game next week, and then, then it starts for real. And, Coach, we look forward to having you on with us uh, uh, periodically through the season. One, because you're smart and you've done it and you're a friend and you, you'll you do it for free. And so those are four very key <laughs> things. Not necessarily in that order. Uh, babe, before we get to five questions and let you go, uh, so let's say we got four left-handed golfers. Uh, we mentioned you, there's Mickelson, there's Weir, and let's throw in Steve Young. Oh, man. Um, and are, then, are you and, and there's Steve, you. Are you saying Steve's a golfer? Yeah, because he has his, he has okay. his golf so, so fundraiser coach, and all that stuff. this is a loose term, stuff. golf. <laughs> So in a free throw shooting contest, how many shots would you have to spot those guys to make it a fair competition? Uh, 
I don't. I, I'm thinking Mike Weir didn't play much basketball in high school. Mm-mm. Not in Canada. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm thinking Steve Young seems like he's pretty athletic and would be a good shooter. <laughs> Who was my fourth? Mickelson. Phil Mickelson. You know the other lefty that he, we know. He can't shoot. Yeah. I don't think Phil can shoot. So what? What do you think? You'd have to spot him. At... If we were shooting best out of ten. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure that I could make eight. Uh, <laughs> you let me warm up a little bit, I might make ten, but I'd probably make eight. I'm I'm, I'm doubtful that any of them would make five. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, you can still you shoot. Tell Steve that. I'm not I, tell I, Steve. I believe Steve Young might be able to make six or seven. Here, here's the thing about Steve: that if you set a challenge out for Steve, and it, it doesn't even have to be any money on it, it's just a pride thing. He would spend every day for the next six days shooting nothing but free throws so that he could make nine. That's Steve. I know he would. That's how hey, he someday, is. Someday, by the way, I've got, we don't have time today, but we have got, I have the greatest Steve Young story when we were in Croatia that you could, and I, I believe I told Steve the story, but someday we need an opportunity to tell that story to the BYU crew. Next time we have you on, we're doing it for sure. Yes, so. I, we would have never got into the country if it wasn't for his. For uh, Steve. Wow. Okay, yeah. we're going to make a note of that, and that's going to be priority number one. When we have you and when we have Steve on, uh, yes. we'll, we'll ask him that. We love Steve Give Young. Me a he's, call. Steve's one, one of my favorites. He's just, we're really close to him. He's taking care of my kids when they were over at Stanford. I, we love the Youngs, they're the best. All right, here come yeah. five questions. You ready? Right. Okay, and just answer them fast. First thing that comes to your mind favorite sports movie? Hoosiers. I knew it. Why is, why is answer? Fa- favorite you, me, singer? and Marie Osmond. Hoosiers. Yeah, Marie Osmond is Hoosiers, too. Favorite singer or band? Uh, Singer or band? Yeah. I'm an R&B guy. I'm, I'm going to go with uh, Temptations. Ooh, I That's like old that. School. Wait, the Temptations, the I got sunshine. That's a, yeah, on a cloudy, on cloudy day. Yeah. day. Yeah, see, Cleve and I get together, we just start singing. Okay. I'm a big R&B guy. Yeah, favorite breakfast cereal? <laughs> Uh, shredded wheat. Well, come on. Frosted oh. shredded wheat. Frosted, Frosted, okay. Okay. You saved Gosh, it. You saved it. <laughs> saved because it. we don't allow anyone to choose a healthy cereal. We would have peppered well, you for every week of this show from here on out until you came back I, with the I, Frosted. I, one of cinnamon to- I like Frosted shredded wheat, and I also like that cinnamon toast. Yeah, okay, a lot cinnamon of people toast like that crunch. That's a, that's a popular one. Okay. We like yes. that, yeah. If somebody comes in here and says, like, f- straight Wheaties without sugar on it, or that, shredded they wheat. can never come back on the show. So, Oatmeal without brown sugar. Stop like it. That. Stop. No, Don't no. even bring that. <laughs> Favorite Halloween candy? Uh, candy corn. You've got to be kidding me. I, I love that stuff. That stuff is the worst. Someone dropped off some on our porch last night. Hey, I thought, hey, I, who I brings mean, somebody today, candy in corn? In modern day, I'd probably say the little mini Twix. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I like those. Hey, <laughs> just, candy hey, corn. At our house on Halloween, um, Last year, we had 1,100 kids come. Yeah, that's what's, it's a big time. I'm not telling anybody where we live, but 1,100 kids came. Really? Don't don't let them down. Don't give out apples this year. No, no, no. If you don't give out full-size candy bars in our neighborhood, you get laughed out of the place. It's terrible. Like, I go broke. I have to take out a loan every year for Halloween. (laughs) So, okay. Here's number five. This is a good one. Number five. The favorite player you've ever coached. Wow. Man, you know, you hate to answer that question because you leave somebody out. Um, well, if you name the favorite, you have to leave out like 500 other ones. Yeah, so that's not a like lot of it's going to be. <laughs> you can't just offend oh. one guy. You can offend like 499. They, Dave thought <laughs> so of this we, question, by the way, Cleve. I didn't want to put you on a spot like this. That's a hard oh, Well, yeah, favorite. but this, is, this one goes right to the core. Yeah. Let's see. You got. It's like he asked me, who's your favorite teammate you've ever played with? I'm like, I'm not telling you that. Yeah, uh, that, that's a hard question. Let, let me. Uh, well, you've already talked about Paul George. That was significant. Yeah. You I mean, go back. I, I to, mean, I, I think the, 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 the BYU thing, I, I, I will tell you this. I don't have a favorite guy, but I'm, I'm going to tell you that the leadership of McKelly Wesley changed this program. And I, and I, I think, tr- I'll be honest with you, the guy that. I knew in Fresno and, and had a relationship with in Terrell the day. He was he, he might be the smartest guy I've ever coached. Wow. Terrell the um, But That's I, cool. I, I listen, Trav, I mean, Trent, I mean, you, you go down the list. I, I, I can't pick so, a favorite. So, they so all many have amazing guys. I love that though. I don't know that people realize that McKelly Wesley came in on the heels of, you know, some rough 
and, and literally was the nucleus to turn a program around. He was a dog. And, I, and, and those guys, Trent Whiting and Travis Hansen would tell you the same thing. Yeah. They would usually say, who, who was the leader of that team? And, uh, and I, I, I appreciate his heart because, because McKelly went through some tough things in his life yes. and he overcame them. And, uh, and and he's got kids playing now. It's fun to see him on social media. And yes, it's happening. great. That, that's why I see him. I see him family. out at little, you know the youth basketball stuff. I see him all the time. And when people say, "Oh, that guy's got some dog in him, like toughness," that's McKelly. I think of McKelly Wesley because McKelly Wesley absolutely had some dog in him. You know why that was yeah, such yeah. a good question? Because it brought out that answer. Yes. So let's not yeah. dog the question. Let's just focus on the answer, which was yep, very insightful. Nice job. Yeah. So, hey, give our best Coach, to Kip. Thanks so much. Yep, yeah, give Kip, Kip a big hug for us, and you know, and the whole whole family. Hey, we're gonna see we'll you see, soon. We'll see you up there this winter for a few games. If you I, get up while it's still warm, we'll go play golf. I'm in the state. Right. I'm in the state. Young men's presence, you know, Skyler. So I see him all the time. Oh, you know, he told me that yesterday. I didn't even know. Yeah, we just I got released from the bishopric up on campus and and moved down, and now I get to see Skyler. We're all running the time. things pretty yeah, loose up here. He did. Skyler told me that. Skyler was with us this last week on business stuff, and so he stayed with us. And he told me, oh, I'm, I'm in the young men's presidency with Wayne. Yeah. Said, this really? is, like the fact that they even give Dave and I jobs just shows you how irresponsible the church is in Utah right now. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You want to move into this stake. That's what you, what you If you ever come back someday, you want to get in this stake uh, where, you've, where you've lived before. But uh, thanks again. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. We'll see you tomorrow. We'll be on the app. Check out the team, and then we'll be back to I talk will. about it. Hey, thanks, guys. Good the great, thanks. You. The great Steve Cleveland, former head coach at BYU and Fresno State and, and uh, one of our good friends for a long, long time. Not many people leave BYU on their own to go do something else that will be better for them. If they leave BYU, usually they got bounced. Not here. Not here. Yeah. He's like, you know what? I, he had the guts to take the job, and they also had the guts – to take the Fresno State job, and they because it was him. what was best for him moving forward, and that opened the door for Dave and Rose. Fresno State needed him bad, and he yeah. felt a commitment to that community. They had some bad things going on. He took it over and helped straighten. Had to it clean around. up after Jerry yep. Tarkanian, and then and then so then there's Dave Rose, which opens the door for Mark Pope, and and here we go tomorrow. Yeah, Dave, night. Dave Rose comes to BYU because of Steve Cleveland.